folks, Rick Barabee here with Dan Mum, real estate extraordinaire. Hey, Tim. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, how's it going? It's good to talk. So I hate to interrupt you. Yeah. So today we're going to have some fun and, uh, you know, during this time, this crazy time, all right, we're going to talk about how to take listings remotely, but at the same time, I want to talk, which is different than remotely taking listings. Yeah, okay, anyway, two opposite things. My humor. Nice but dad joke. Rick and his dad jokes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but we're going to take you through the whole process. Like, I want to use an example, like one you've done in the in not so distant future, yeah. um, right from the beginning. So let's start with, like, okay, so we're going to end up with how you did it remotely, but let's start in the beginning. Like, pick a listing. Um, how did you prospect them and all that good stuff? So let's pick. Yeah, I just took one last night. So all right, good. Perfect example. There's a perfect uh, one. So this was a for sale by owner. And so I talked to them, it was actually a, a really long time ago, it was about a year ago, I think, when I first talked to them. And uh, send out, a, when I'm trying to remember how many times I spoke to them in the beginning. I called them the first day they came on the market as a for sale by owner, which is good, you want to be the first person they talk to. So it was a physical. They, they got yeah. a bunch of calls after me and they didn't really remember anyone else because I was the first person to talk to them. Okay. And then um, I didn't even really preview the property because she couldn't really show it. I, I never really understand that for sale by owners. I can't show it, but they want to try and sell it. But I'm like, okay. Uh, this was a year ago. And then we just kept in touch after that. And then she actually said she had a buyer and then she was in contract and then she wasn't in contract. Basically just kept following up with her. And then finally, I guess the last buyer that she had just backed out recently. And I decided to call her. I didn't know that. I just decided to follow up with her call her yesterday. And she said, yeah, I just want to get it on the market. Uh, so we listed it, and this is a good example. I never actually saw the property. She had her own picture. She sent them to me. I looked at it. I evaluated the pricing, and that was it. So nice. Okay, so let's. So, so, okay, so you talked to her a year ago. Do you remember what their motivation was at that time? Uh, yeah, it's financial. So I, she was actually dealing with some job issues at the time, with potentially losing her job, and now it's even worse given what's going on, obviously. So. Uh, her motivation has just increased. So she was under financial issues, but she obviously had enough money to extend her to pain by a year. It. Right, right. She didn't <laughs> want to, but I guess she did. Yeah. So that, by the way, the reason I say it like that is it's very important to understand that Dan and I, we started talking about FISBOs. We, even when you first were him and the expires, we talked about doing the FISBO process, and you kind of tighten that process up yep. to a little tighter time frame. But even so, it's very common to talk to somebody a year ago, follow up, follow up. Do you remember how many times exactly you followed up with her? Uh, it was more than 10, which is not really typical. I don't usually continue to follow up with someone, but in this case, I just knew that her motivation level was high and uh, we had a good relationship. She would always engage with me, she would respond to me, so it kind of made sense to do that. Perfect, and, and, and people have a, you know, a, a pain threshold, especially for sale by owners. You know, and a lot of times for sale by owners are disgruntled expires that expired a long time ago. So they have a certain amount of pain, and it's just, I've been doing this for years, there's a certain amount of pain that they need to go through, or you can call it education, you can call it whatever you want. Some of them have more money to do it, some of them don't. That's an extreme example, but it's not uncommon at the same time, it happens. But you know, the thing is, it, well, I'll give you the NAR numbers, okay? The NAR numbers say that 94% of all for sale by owners end up using a real estate agent. Okay. Now, that can mean um, they list with them, and a small amount, very small amount, means I've accepted a buyer agency, a buyer agent contract, okay, and sold my property myself. That happens very rarely. 95% of that 94% are people that actually try, can't sell themselves, and end up listing with an agent. Okay? NAR has another interesting stat, okay, which says that the, four, the 6% that actually sell themselves end up sacrificing 11 to 13% of their equity. Okay, which sounds kind of like an eye buyer, which by the way, you don't have a lot of competition with them anymore. Right, yeah, so we didn't talk about that in the last one, but oh, go ahead. I, I was just saying we had a few, unfortunately I had a few sellers who had offers from eye buyers and they all backed out, but the good opportunity there obviously is there's just way less competition. And I think that's true. I wasn't even really in the market in the last major downturn, but you could speak to this that Supposedly, when there's major downturns, if there was one, I don't really expect that, but all of the discount brokers go away to a yeah, large degree. No all doubt. The I buyers, the discount brokers, all of them. Well, the I buyers are very, very much um, Wall Street driven. Right. And Wall Street lost 30% in the last, which is amazing, by the way. I'm still like scratching my head. It's right. coming back up a little bit now, but 30% of the value that went away, and that's where they get a lot of their money. So that's why almost everybody I've talked to, every deal under contract, has pretty much been washed out, and it would take a huge rebound 
which probably won't happen. So now, what does that mean in Vegas? Vegas, it's about 6% of the market. Arizona, it's about the same. It, it's not going to be a huge jump, and it's really below 400, most of it. But, but still, it's still, it's still good yeah, for the market. it's a net positive for the agents. It's, it's, yeah, a, net it's, a, the it's agents. a net positive for the agent. So back to the numbers now. So 94% up using an agent, 6% to sell themselves, sacrifice 11 to 13%. And the average time they try this is about six weeks. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's more average? Yeah, that's the exact time that I've just found anecdotally is like that four to six week period. And there's exceptions to that. There's people that I meet day one, talk to them as soon as they come on the market and I list them that day and because they just realize really, really quickly that it doesn't work. But yeah, I'd say the average is about four to six weeks. Okay, now, so this particular woman, let's go back to that example. So you talk to her, you talk to her, you talk to her. She sent you over the pictures. Mm -hmm. You did your CMA that way. Yeah, so you want to talk about actually taking the listing? Like yes. when I actually took yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, so, and this is what we're basically talking about, how to take listings remotely. Uh, the first thing is that I was always of the belief that you didn't even always need to see a house to list it and sell it to begin with. I know a lot of people disagree with that, but um, now it's the only way to do it, so you kind of have to agree with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I never really thought that because if, if you ask enough questions on the phone, you really qualify the seller, you ask them, you have a good, deep conversation with them, you ask them about the condition of the house, you get a good answer to that question where they describe the house to you, and you get their pricing expectations, you have a good, solid conversation, and then if you are able to have them send you pictures so you can actually see the condition of the house, well, now there's really no need for you to go see it. It's right. like you've done everything that you would have done in person. Um, so that's what we did in this case. It was a, most houses in Vegas anyway, I know every market's different, but in Vegas, most of the houses here are not custom houses. They're right. model matches to the ones right next to them, right? That's like 80% of them. Uh, so valuating properties, it's very, very straightforward. If you know the condition, you've asked some questions on the phone, it's easy to determine the actual value without really seeing the house in person. Um, so the, yeah, that's what we did in this case to answer your question. She sent me the pictures. I sent over a, um, a proposal in an email that had a net sheet, the comps, the listing contract. I set a specific time to talk to her. I think that's important. So what we don't- Like an appointment over the phone. Right, right. What you don't want to do is this thing of, uh, okay, well, I'll send you the information and then right. we'll go from there. Right. And then it's just like you call and then you call and you call and you never get in touch with them again. I try and keep that listing process exactly the same as I would meeting them as we do over the phone. So right. we set an actual bona fide appointment to talk on the phone with all the decision makers and I ask them the qualifying questions before, I send them the pre-listing package, I confirm that they get it, I do it through email mostly now uh, for this scenario and yeah, right. that's that. Right, and, and, even, and even with today with what's going on, it's the perfect, I mean if, you're, if you have never tried it, this is the perfect time to try it because you're not supposed to be with it, that's why we're standing a little far apart here. You're not supposed to be too close to anybody right now. Right. And so it's the perfect time to try it. It's like I always just say, like when it's dark at 4.30, it's the perfect time to get them to leave work to show the property right. because you can't see the place unless the day. So the, 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 you know, and I was telling Dan before this too, um, you know, these next few weeks and the few weeks we've already had, to me this was perfect, like I'm from New England. Like what Dan was just talking about, about a CMA or doing value, in Arizona and in Nevada, it's, probably two of the easiest place, and California is not far off either, some of the easiest places to do a CMA because you only have five or six styles, right? Where I'm from, I mean, you can, the house would be built in 17, 18, yeah, every house is wildly different. Every house is huge, but I still, I still did it there. Mm -hmm. and, this, and also, this market, to me, this market is very, like, very similar to what my market used to be, half of December, all of January, all of February. Where, because of snow and sleet and freezing rain, I did a lot of my appointments over the phone, and I was packing my pipeline for when the weather get better. Here, you're going to be packing your pipeline for when the playing field gets better, when all this gets behind us. But you never have to stop. You just alter. It's the perfect time to exercise your versatility if you need to work on that. There's a whole bunch of things it's perfect for, and we're going to keep covering those topics. Instead of having the success center over, obviously, we're going to keep doing these until we can open it again. Yeah, and we'll talk about on a separate one of these, we'll talk about how to actually sell the listings and how to modify your process there for when what we're dealing with. But one thing that's funny is I actually really like what's going on because I, I'm liking not having to drive out to properties. It's kind of nice. Just I take listings from the office or my house. It's less driving time for me. I hate driving. So uh, any way that I can do that, I enjoyed doing it before, but it's, it's working out really well because it actually saves some time. I love it. And, and, it's, and you're creating new habits right. and new disciplines that you will, will uh, and a lot of you can do that right now too. Like, 
I love going to the gym. The gym is not open. I had to change my workout, okay? Now I'm doing pull up. If you saw where I do pull ups, you'd laugh. <laughs> it's like an overhanging right next yeah. to my pool. Mm -hmm. But whatever, you just have to alter, be versatile. You can always, if you're committed, you will always find a way. And if you're not, if you're not committed, then you'll find an excuse. Why. And if you're the first person to adapt, there's going to be a big advantage for you because Huge. people still need our help. There's a lot of people out there. And if you're out there telling buyers and sellers, hey, I know how to work around this, right. we've already set up our own marketing plan, our new listing strategy. This is what we're going to do. That's really, really attractive. And then one other thing too. Uh, with the sellers, if they're really motivated, and a lot of them who are thinking about selling now are very motivated because they might be a little worried about what's going to happen with pricing, um, they want to get homes on the market as soon as possible. That's right. what I'm noticing. Right. A lot of sellers are telling me, the ones that I list are saying, hey, we're ready to go right away. Like, Send us the documents. We'll send you the pictures. Let's just get it on. Um, so it just makes it easier right. because the, they're willing to cooperate with you in that way. Now, and if you have buyers too, great point too, great point. Um, when you have um, buyers, right, you have like an unfair advantage right now because yeah, your yeah. competition has been... We should do a whole different one on buyers yeah. because they're a really big asset now. If you have buyers that are solid and working still, that's huge. Yeah, now California, a little different because they're the tightest right now. So you got to be careful in California. Uh, you're not supposed to do that, but in Arizona and Nevada, you still can. But can I know California is still... Virtually, though? Buyers can still virtually write offers and... They sure can. Yeah. And that's what I'm, exactly what I was going to say. But you can do it virtually. As a matter of fact, car... They've never done this before, but in the remarks section of your listing, you can now put that video tour, right, or whatever it's called now. Yeah, virtual tour. Virtual, virtual tour, tour. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I still gotta get all the lingo down. I still say tape. We're taping. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not really using tape anymore. Anyway, any other any, any other thoughts as far as uh, listing? yeah, taking listings remotely. I guess the key to this entire process is understanding that being sounding good on the phone is even more important than it was before. I know we talked about that already, right. but. Because of the fact that you can't rely on face-to-face -face anymore, a lot of agents say, oh, well, I'm better face-to-face, -face. so I'm just gonna kind of, they use that as a crutch to not develop skills, but now you don't have a choice. You have to sound good on the phone because that's your only way of doing this. Um, so I would just, that speaks more to the importance of practice and role play. Uh, and I'm a little disappointed my role play partners have been slacking off because of what's going on, so I gotta find new ones. Uh, but Which that's is always what, a challenge. Yeah, and that's what you have to work on right now. Uh, but the, I think the key to Taking listings remotely is sounding good on the phone, that's one. And then two, just trying to keep that listing process exactly the same where you set an appointment with them, not just, hey, let's talk next week sometime, maybe I'll send you everything. Set an actual bona fide appointment. Hey, what time are you and your wife or you and your husband available? We can talk on the phone, we'll go over all the listing documents, and then you guys can decide what you wanna do. Pre-qualify them exactly the same way. Right. You have to ask a lot of questions about the condition of the house. So if you ask them, hey, can you please describe the home for me? And they say, oh, well, it's good. It's, it's in pretty good shape. That's not enough. We're not, right. Because we're not going to, and if they're living there, you're not going to be able to see the house in a lot of cases in a lot of markets. So you need, you need to ask them more specific right. questions. Okay, well, tell me more about that. What types of finishes are inside? If it's renovated, what does that mean, right? When was it last renovated? That's right. a good question. Like when you say renovated, how recently was it renovated? What types of finishes, countertops, floors, what's the paint color? Uh, any major things that need to be worked on, the roof, the AC, the water heater, things like that. Uh, you need to ask some really specific questions, and I would say have a good five or ten minute conversation about the condition of the house yep. so that you're prepared to price it appropriately and make those decisions on the phone when you do your actual presentation. So Good. And, and I know what some of you are thinking, because I coach a lot of you, and uh, I know you're thinking, well, but I don't, I don't have the same skills as Dan. My first thought is, you could. Because remember? Yeah. yeah. Look, at, see, look at Danny smiling. He had to zero. work on that. Yeah. yeah I started <laughs> at zero with my skill level. So. Right. So, but you could. But, see, now I'm going to be a company guy for a minute here. Even if you're not tremendous over the phone yet, okay, we have tremendous products to help you as a company. Tools. Okay. To, like the buy side report. I mean, I know agents, newer ones especially, that basically their process and their presentation is around the buy side report. You could use that because it shows how many people. It's very, very, it makes you look good. It's, it's very well done. You can use that. Send that to them, okay, and then go over that with them. So there's all, many diff all kinds of different things you can do. But I'm telling you, in this time, what Dan is talking about, working on your skills, role playing, all of that is critically important. Also, um, like your CRM, I, I mentioned this on Mark's call a couple days ago. A lot of you, I know, don't have an organized CRM right now. Make sure they're on the VAC or whatever CRM you're using. Berkshire Hathaway has tremendous newsletters. Also, the buy, you know, the buy side report, another buy side report, but uh, market market watch. There's all kinds of tools you can use, okay, to make 
uh, you look more professional and better, and you should. Your CRM should be organized, right? Yep. Yours is. I agree. Yeah, it has to be. And you use newsletters too, don't you? Yeah, it's yeah. all automated. I have staff do it, but uh, what I've noticed recently too is that a lot of the results that I'm getting, listings wise, are from follow ups actually. Like, yeah, I'm getting some good results with some new business, but I've noticed that a lot of my follow ups have been way more effective than usual because there were a lot of people on the fence that just kind of want to move right now. And having your CRM organized and structured so you know you're staying on top of that's really important. And right. because, like always, there's there's less people working now. And when you're following up with leads, you're not the only person calling them in general, right? We like to right. think that. So uh, if you're doing that effectively, now's the time to do it. Right. Because there are three types of people right now with what's going on in the coronavirus situation. There's one type of person that's business as usual, mm -hmm. that they and they expect you to be professional and help them. If someone's closed on a property and they have a house on the market and they've got two mortgage payments, they expect you to sell their home for them. So be careful who you're talking to. So some people are business as usual. I would say about a third of them. A third of them hit the pause button. Let's see what's going to happen. And a third of them are just so emotional and can't do anything because of it. Probably will wait a few months until things get back to normal. And it's your job to exercise versatility, okay, personality styles, to yeah. understand who you're talking to. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. I also say when, when you're talking about like to me this is my rule of thumb the longer the follow-up the less the presentation mm -hmm. the shorter the follow-up the more the presentation right? right when you don't have the rapport built with that right so right. The, the one you did you've been talking to a year I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess the presentation was pretty easy yeah it was four or five minutes right yeah she was yeah this was like an extreme example of that where she was so enamored by me and she was so grateful for me following up that long it wasn't even a, a thought to list with anyone right. else would be with me. So. Yeah, the, the longer, when you're showing your professional, now I'm not recommending that you should have a year follow, but right. it happens sometimes. This is an unusual situation. Right. Yeah, but it happens sometimes. And I'm gonna tell you, the longer you've been following up with them, like one of my uh, coaching clients in uh, Arizona, same situation, 12 months, and the seller actually said to her, she, she always asks, why did you pick me? And he said, because you're the last one standing. <laughs> right. It's been a year, you're the only one still calling me. So exercise, I mean, be professional, and don't be, follow up is, you know, as a lot of you hear me say, when follow-up is done properly, and I know Dan does it this way, I call it semi-stalker, not full-on stalker, mm -hmm. but semi-stalker lead follow-up. You can't, look at, they're, if they're thinking about buying or selling, okay, and you're following up, they're gonna use you, even when they ignore you for a while. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Can I add two things about listings? Go right ahead, please. please. So, uh, one thing that I would be ready with, I talked to my coach about this actually, is having market stats. I don't know if we talked about this on the last one. I would have actual stats so you can give people facts because if you're talking to buyers and sellers, a lot of them are asking us, hey, what's going on? Like, should I do this? Should I not do it? What you don't want to do is tell people what you think will happen because no one knows. Right? Mark said that too. Yeah, you don't want to be telling people, hey, this is what's going to happen. You don't want to speculate. What we want to do is ask them what they think, what they think, and then you can help guide them make the best decision based on that, right? And then if you can back that up with stats. So, hey, just so you know, Mrs. Seller, uh, in the last week, there's been X number of homes that have sold, X number of homes that have come on the market. So there's still properties that are moving. Uh, there's still closings happening. We closed X number of transactions in the last month. So this way you can just give them the facts. We wanna try and avoid the whole speculating thing. And then the second thing I would say is, you should be, because we're talking about the listing process, you should be, you should have some ideas ready for if sellers ask you what you're going to do differently now because of what's going on. You should have that as part of your listing pitch, basically. So I would really take some time to think about that. Have some specific bullet points of what you're going to do differently now with your listings than you did before. The virtual tour is a great idea, being virtual able to tour. add that to the agent to agent remarks. Um, using virtual showings more often. Uh, doing a quick change that we've made is that instead of for, for properties that are occupied, we just request that the buyers write an offer contingent on viewing it. For, for straightforward properties like a condo where it's, it, you know what it's gonna look like. Or it's vacant. Yeah, or it's vacant. We say, hey, write the, well, vacant one they would actually see, but if it's yeah. occupied, we put in there, hey, just write the offer contingent on viewing it, and then if we come to terms on the price and we agree, then you'll view it at that time. Right. So these are all things you can tell the seller that you're gonna do so that you can kind of ease their concerns, and that's a way to actually get more business because they see that you're more prepared. And what a way to figure out if your buyer's serious or not. Well, right. here's how we have to do it today. Right. All right, and that's, I mean, it's, it, out of every thing that happens that's usually crazy like this, there's always some good that comes out of it, and you can tighten up the way you do it, you can tighten up the way you qualify, you can get really good at uh, filling your pipeline. There's a lot of uh, things that'll happen that you can, look, did I wish this never happened? Yes, of course. 
But since it has happened, we have to de decide to find what things we can grow from by this, okay, as we move on into the next And it's chapter. not a huge change to the process, really, for buyers. It's not that big of a change. So vacant Not for you, but <laughs> yeah. for some of us. <laughs> well, for vacant properties, completely unaffected, right? right? Well, in our market, anyway, buyers can still view them. Uh, in other markets, they can't. But the real estate industry was kind of trending in the direction of going more virtual and remote anyway. Absolutely. People were buying homes without seeing them and doing things virtually. So this is just kind of a little prod to go yeah, in that direction it, a little it, bit it more. It actually makes you, um, yeah. And yeah, it's not a huge change. The buyers that I'm working with anyway, and I'm really grateful for them right now because it's, it's hard to find them, but the buyers that I'm working with, I just, I explain that to them, hey, this is how it's done now. And they understand, they don't want to get sick, right? People right. are reasonable, yeah. especially in a time like this. So they say, yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll write an offer, contingent on viewing it. And if we don't like it, then we'll just cancel the offer. And it makes sense. sense. Yeah, it makes it's sense perfect sense. Okay, um, any questions on there? Okay, so we'll get those later. All right, any, any final thoughts from you? Uh, no, no, I think a good topic will be, like we said, uh, talking about how to actually sell these listings remotely. We talked a little bit about it. Absolutely. And uh, buyers will be good to talk Working about Working with too. buyers, yeah. that's two, and then we'll do, I got a couple in mind too that we'll do as well. So once again, the schedule, every Wednesday, Monday and Wednesday, me and Dan here at the Success Center from nine to whatever, 9.30, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1.30 with Mark Stark. Okay, any questions, you guys, that'll be playing over and over. Ask them, because we always look at them before we do this uh, next um, episode here, so. All right, good. thanks, Dan, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right, guys, thanks for showing up. Have a good one. Woo!